The Immortal Game, Chapter 9, An Alicorn's War. Captain Coconut Crunch led a group of over two dozen puppets and a half a dozen true pony soldiers through the streets of Outer Counterlot. As she moved, the ponies in the streets rushed to get out of her way. None of them would look at her or the puppets. The outer city might not have a strong loyalist presence, but that didn't mean its citizens couldn't love the new routine. Well, Coconut thought to herself, it didn't have a strong noise present until they showed up. Now I'm patrolling with 30 senators total. The puppets under her command made her feel a little uncomfortable. But well, the way things have been going recently, they also made her feel a little safer. Although, I feel a lot more safe if I had some of those unicorns. One among the Marian's army was that even the five didn't fancy fighting terrorist unicorn puppets. Or at least, word was that the unicorn puppets could slow them down. Those were only rumors, though. A coconut had heard a lot of rumors about both sides. Some ponies said a general esteem eight fillies and cults to sustain his eternal youth. The same ponies then turned around and said the five were actually puppets in disguise. Coconut, like any warm-blooded pony in Equestria, would have preferred it if Titan and Terra never come. She would have liked it if Celestia still ruled. She couldn't change the past, however. Neither could any of the loyalists. Celestia was dead. And there was no amount of rebelling ponies was going to overthrow the Nergu gods. They were gods, after all. Coconut was only trying to keep things orderly and make enough bits to put a roof overhead. The captain was brought out of her thoughts as a jagged metal spike buried itself into cobblestones 30 feet away from her. A thin cord ran from the end of the miniature harpoon, leading up to a rooftop of a nearby building. Her eyes followed the cord, and when she saw an earth pony standing atop a building, or form silhouetted by the sun behind her, Coconut watched in amazement as the pony fastened the end of the cord to the rooftop and jumped off the four-story structure. Somehow, the pony hooked the side of an armored four-leg into the cord and zip-lined to the streets below, landing with an acrobatic tumble as she tore the harpoon from the cobblestones. The enemy pony was wearing what had to be the most ridiculous set of armor Coconut had ever seen. Strapped to one of her forelegs was a firing mechanism for the blade grappling hook. She snapped the hook that she had fired earlier into the contraption, the trailing cord was wound into a receiver on her soldier. On her other foreleg was a similar mechanism. As Coconut Watts, the Earth Pony reached back to where several sort of blades were strapped to her back. One of the blades clicked into the contraption. With another click, it was extended a point outward for the pony's foreleg. Beyond her foreleg armaments, the pony's outfit became even stranger. Small tubing ran from each of the contraptions to several canisters of what Coconut assumed to be compressed gas harnessed to the pony's back. Pouches and containers sat along the canisters, and a few flats of fabric hung down from between the gear. Atop their heads sat a strange set of goggles that appeared to have several lenses each. She wasn't wearing the goggles over her eyes, but rather had them sitting askew, partially obscured by her wild mane. What was more, every single piece of the outfit was probably to paint a bright color. No two pieces shared the same shade. The point looked more like a circus performer than one of Luna's terrifying effective elites. Despite her silly appearance, Coconut still had to swallow her fear at the sight of the pony. She was very certain her squad could take the mare down, but if one of the elites was around, more could appear at any moment. If that happened, she would need air support. She couldn't let her troops see her be afraid. Even if only six of them were real ponies capable of sentient thought, she cleared her throat, a surprise when the newly arrived enemy did not rush them or run away. Tikamina Diane Pai, Coconut said, Managing to keep her voice clear and steady. Yep! The pink earth pony beamed at the sound of her name. Coconut wondered what she would say next. She hadn't thought the pony would stay still this long, let alone answer her. Maybe there wouldn't be a fight after all. While she was sure her forces would win against the lone pony, she was also sure victory would cost them a few pony lives. She didn't want that. You are under arrest! She sounded loudly. Pink me looked up. Nope! Yep! She said carefully, poking at the end of your hair above her with a blade for like, Y'all rest here! Is she crazy? The coconut thought, was just mocking me. Either way, it didn't matter. Either come quietly, or we will be forced to subdue you. Pigamia looked around at the civilians who gathered around to see what the commotion was about. Coconut thought it must be a quite strange sight. A single pony facing down 30 soldiers. You got every pony! Pigamia said loudly, It's gonna be a fight! May I tail it out here so no pony gets hurt! Coconut could appreciate what Pigamia was doing, so she waited for the civilians to carry the streets before she gave her order. She turned to her soldiers. Her puppets, 
all of whom were Earth ponies. Pickets I took to the sky, unicorns were needed in the inner city. So this far out from the barrier, almost all the soldiers on the ground were Earth ponies. Take her, she said. Her soldiers and puppets charged. Coconut, being an officer, remained behind. So he expected that Pikamina could fight well. Certainly the pony had come equipped for a fight. She had the advantage of numbers, though, and her soldiers were not incompetent when it came to hoof hoof combat. Now her opponent might take a few of them down with her, or she would eventually fall herself. Or so Coconut Crunch thought. She was wrong. Pikamina didn't go down fighting. Pikamina didn't go down. She began by raising a foreleg, the one that had the blade attached to it, and pulling at the nearest surf pony. She bit down on the strap of her mouth and pulled. There was a loud hiss as the contraction expelled a white cloud of gas, and the blade was shot through the air. It stuck a puppet in the neck, just feet away from Pikamina. As the puppet dispersed, Pikamina rushed forward, faster than Coconut would have thought possible. It thrust her foreleg into the cloud of dark mist. There was an audible click, and Pikamina emerged from the fancy cloud with the blade she had used to secure her foreleg once more. She lost no momentum, spinning to bring the blade across the throat of another puppet before they knew she was upon them. She stabbed another in the eye before she cleared a group of charging soldiers, destroying a third puppet within a second of the other two. Coconut's soldiers and puppets all alike experienced a moment of confusion as they reached the place where Pikamiya had been only moments before. They slid to a halt. They turned to find Pikamiya in between them and their captain. They charged her again, but not before Pikamiya turned to Coconut and said with a genuinely tearful smile, it's Pinkie Pie! Then Pinkie Pie fired a blade grapple and hook into the nearest surf pony puppet and dug into the puppet's chest, but it was not a lethal blow. Pinkie tugged on the metal cord, connecting her foreleg to the puppet. The puppet staggered forward and thrown off balance. Then Pinkie ran at the puppet, leaping just before she reached it. She hit the puppet, hind legs first, and drove her blade into its brain. Before it dispersed, however, Coconut watched Pinkie leap forward off the puppet and to center, flipping over the group of soldiers and puppets in an impossibly high jump. While she was in the air, she aimed her foreleg downward and pulled the firing mechanism with her mouth once more. Her blade shot downward with another release of compressed gas and threw a point first through the back of another puppet's neck. Spine, throat, and major artery severed. It dispersed. Pinky landed and casually slipped inside the other guard puppet, grabbing its head and breaking its neck. Coconut watched with a mixture of horror and amazement as her troops stopped once more to turn and find Pinkie Pie un behind them unscathed. The pony had taken out six puppets and not taken a single hit. In fact, not one of her soldiers had even taken a swing at the pony yet. Pinkie Pie looked around with a grin on her face as she loaded another blade into her strange mechanism. Then she dove into the crowd of soldiers once more, still smiling. Except this time, the first pony she came across was not a puppet, but one of the true pony soldiers. Her soldier turned and kicked out with his hind legs as he approached the pink menace, but Pinkie Pie was simply too fast. She moved to the side, tossing his kick and retracting her blade. Grant grabbed one of his hind legs with her forelegs and twisted. Coconut's soldier was thrown to the ground. No! Coconut thought. He known the rest. All of them did. Coconut was still watching hard as Luna's elite came over King soldiers. No pony should have to die for King Titan or Princess Luna. This is wrong. Pinkie Pie didn't deliver a defensive blow, though. Instead, she simply rolled under a punch and drove her blade into the neck of another puppet before carrying on. Coconut watched as her soldier, confused, got up to rejoin the fight. Pinkie Pie came out of the grip of soldiers with two more kills. Stopping again to face Coconut and wearing her crazed grin. What's yours? She asked as though she had not just finally slain eight puppets. Coconut managed to find her voice. Don't come at all at once! She shouted. Spread out! Surrender! Her soldiers moved to follow her orders. The pink menace had higher ideas, however. She plucked a small, cylindrical container from her harness. It was made of metal and painted red with what Coconut thought was a yellow happy face on it. She then held it in her teeth as she released the blade from her forearm then lowered the container into her launcher. As the soldiers came at her, she aimed at her center and fired. The metal canister was launched through the air with another hiss of compressed gas and exploded into a cloud of rapidly spreading smoke. The smoke spun and swirled at a dizzying rate. It was every color imaginable. No, Coconut corrected herself. It was not every color. Only the bright colors that Pinkie Pie wore. Her soldiers would be evil and easy to distinguish in the cloud, but Luna's elite was perfectly camouflaged. She couldn't see what happened next clearly because she couldn't see the enemy pony. Several times she would catch a glimpse of her puppets jerking violently and then dispersing. She heard the occasional sound of Pinkie Pie's launching mechanisms going off. Several times she heard the sound of her own true pony soldiers grunting as they sustained what Coconut hoped were non-lethal wounds. She wondered why Pinkie Pie had not elected to kill her soldiers, or even wound them. She had not expected such compassion. 
her soldiers were not likely to return it in kind. Before she had come to the earth for city, she had horrible things about the five. While she didn't believe that the loyalists were evil, she did think they were wrong. There's no fight in point in fighting for Luna, no point in causing more chaos in an already troubled time. Titan had won. At last the smoke began to clear, and Coconut was pleased with what she saw. Ten puppets and all of her soldiers remained. Pinkie Pie was backed against the wall. Coconut was confident that while Pinkie's combat skills wouldn't be superior to that of her soldiers, she couldn't take 16 points at once. Again, the Pink Menace seemed to think differently. Pinkie fired a strange blade grappling hook upward, yanking on the trailing cord so that the hook dug into the leads of the stone building behind her. First, Coconut thought she was going to run, and then Pinkie detached the metal cord from a four-leg launcher and fitted the receiving mechanism on her back. She took another strap and put it into her mouth, then tugged. The mechanism on her back now held a cord word, and the length of the metal went taut. Pinkie reached up with both her forelegs, and the two blades clicked into their four-leg launchers. She brought her forelegs in front of her, brandishing the weapons. Pinky retracted the blades to trip one of Coconut's soldiers, then extended them once more to behead a puppet. She brought two punches, broke the foreleg of the puppet who attacked her, then jumped over six feet in the air to land behind it and put a blade through his base of its skull. Coconut's soldiers closed in around her, but Pinkie Pie tugged a strap in her mouth and the cord went taut. As he pulled towards the wall, she jumped and did a three-quarter backward somersault through the air, landing with her hind legs on the horizontal surface. Coconut Crunch watched with growing despair as Pinkie Pie brought her forces from beyond the wall, battling him at a 90 degree angle. Her ponies were fast, but Pinkie Pie was clearly faster and better trained. The pink mess matched him blow for blow. Multicolored board had jumped and spun along the wall, always out of reach. She destroyed two more puppets in less than 10 seconds out of lightning fast combat. Then, Pinkie Pie jumped away from the wall as the cord went slack once more. She tugged on the cord, and high above them, the grappling harpoon came free. Pinkie Pie landed with soldiers between herself and the wall, then casually launched both her blades through another puppet's eyes. The Pink Menace loaded her final blade into an open launcher, then reached up with her other foreleg and fastened the core of her grapple harpoon into the other. A puppet tried to tackle her. Pinkie Pie rolled out of the way. Then, the puppet was yanked forward, Pinkie's grapple harpoon caught in the back. Pinkie executed with her blade, then reeled in her grapple harpoon until she had a few slack. As he bit down the cord, and began to swing the cord and the harpoon in a small vertical circle with her foreleg. STOP! To Coconut's surprise, they did. Pinkie Pie froze in place, letting the grapple harpoon fall to the ground with a clatter. Her soldiers faced Pinkie warily, but made no move to attack. The puppets merely stopped moving, each of them turning to her in unison. We are not mats! Keep this up and she's going to kill us! At this, her soldiers relaxed visibly. They apparently been thinking along the same lines. Coconut didn't blame them. She looked at Pinkie Pie. It was panting as she fed her harpoon's metal cord into a receiver on the back. They haven't the Pegasus eye come to reinforce us yet. Well, duh, they're fighting. Fighting who? You have only one Pegasus waiting to take the air. We have hundreds of puppets. That's just Luna! Pinkie Pie practically said the name. Coconut felt the bottom drop out of her stomach. If Luna had finally revealed herself, that something big was happening. It also meant that their Pegasus eye were probably preoccupied. And Coconut wasn't going to get any help from above. So what are you doing, then? What are you here for? This Pinkie Pie's grin whined. Why, you, of course. You're under arrest, Captain Currents. Rarity gingerly stepped around a small concentration of rubble as he sliced and diced a nearby Earth Pony puppet. Her cut had been toward her, a clean, diagonal swipe through the puppet's body. She grinned as he was splattered with conjured blood just moments before it vanished into the dark, an ether that all puppets became upon death. At this point, she wasn't particularly bothered by the false gore that sometimes lingered just long enough to see before vanishing. She just hated feeling messy, even for an instant. She so asked him mind and flipped her mane away from her eyes as her blade broke into parts and punched the lethal holes into the three nearby puppets. She so reformed it in time to cleave a changing puppet in two and wrinkled her nostrils in distaste as the dark ether washed over her. She searched around for more puppets, but found none. Instead, she spotted a pale blue unicorn stallion at the end of the street. She cursed inwardly at the sight of the civilian. Now she would have to escort somebody out of the conflict zone, leaving Applesack to rescue prisoners on her own. Unless, of course, Luna or Rainbow Dash decided to put their hose on the ground for once. Hello there! She called out to the civilian. He turned, and she noted for the first time what he was wearing. Did it take me that long to judge him based on his clothes? She thought to herself. Ready, my dear? You're becoming too much a soldier. This conflict is not good for you. The stallion was wearing a full-body white robe, complete with a white hood. 
Red Eye recognized Yaffa immediately. She's wearing the exact same thing. Under her own robe, she wore several thick pads of hardened cloth and a harness for purple. It was an extremely light garment, the mark of a unicorn knight, a blade caster. Rarity would have to design her own outfit with a little more flair, but Princess Luna insisted she conformed to traditions. Still, her design skills allowed her to make sure her argument was appropriately beautiful. It was almost incandescently white. She magically spun the fabric to reflect more in common light than any mundane material. It was loose. It tended to build around her as she moved quickly, but it was so light that it didn't inhabit any movement whatsoever. Rain flowed around her head in lazy curls, spilling down to her drawn back hood, where it was collided against the rippled fabric. Randy had grown to like the blade casting robe. It, along with her white coat, gave her a silver stare appearance that anticipated by the completely transparent diamonds that made a forple. The Iron Knight stared at her coldly. Rarity noticed that his robe was made of drab white fabric. It wasn't keeping away the dust that came along with the rubble that way it was hers was. Damn Rarity, he said coldly. Knight Bateret of the Order Nocturnus. I am Sir Ironhoof, Knight Bateret of the Natural Order. If you do not surrender to me and face Titan's judgment, I will be forced to slay you in single combat. Rarity raised a huff to her chest. Bateret! I am Knight Commander of the Order Nocturnus, signed Ironhoof. This one actually done quite well, other than mistaking her rank. Titles were important, after all. Sir Ironhoof tilted his head. You're our only member of the Order Nocturnus. Luna hasn't had knights for a thousand years. I'm still Knight Commander, and it's Princess Luna! He sighed. You aren't going to come quietly, are you? Rarity leveled her blade. It's ironic, really, she said in a conversational tone. I always dreamed of being rescued by a white knight. I see. A handful of shards came of some mundane metal or other were thrown upward from the ground, round Iron Hoof and towards Rarity. She extended her magical senses, pinging each of the shards with her mind, then split forepole and sent a diamond fragment after each one of them. The shards and diamonds collided in the air, rebounding off of one another before each blade caster reformed their blade. Rarity noted that Iron Hoof's weapon had only had eleven fragments, forepole had fourteen. She now knew that she could safely send three shards at him without leaving herself defenseless. Unfortunately, doing so would kill him, and Forpal was not a good weapon for exercising restraint. Ironhoof charged her as he telekinetically tossed several stones at her. Rarity frowned at the oncoming stones. She couldn't intercept them without Forpal without giving Ironhoof an opening, so she was forced to quickly roll to the side to avoid them. Her blade casting rope didn't pick up any dirt, but she felt filthy nonetheless. Ironhoof reached her as she came out of her roll, swinging his blade. A length of thick, dull metal. The air around Forpal snapped as Rarity's blade moved quickly to intercept it. Ironhoof's attack had been a competent one, a clever move at that. He just hadn't taken into account the fact that Rarity outclassed him by an order of magnitude. His blade was thrown to the side by the force of Rarity's swing. Rarity had time to slap it across the face with the back of her blade before batting another one of his swings. He took another swipe at her, and Rarity ignored it, slapping him across the face again before casting the attack contentiously at the last moment one of her diamond weapon. Ironhoof looked past the two blades with Rarity with disbelief, blood running from one of his nostrils. Knight Commander! Rarity corrected again. It was then that she caught a squint of a red, flat the back of one of Forpal's composite diamonds. Rarity gave a slight moan as she watched Ironhoof's eyes widen. Things that always had to get so complicated. She threw her magical weight against Forpal, pushing Ironhoof at his blade back momentarily. Then, she sent a soft ripple of thought through her blade, willing to reflect more light than diamonds normally would, so you would need the extra visibility for this particular fight. Rarity pivoted just in time to reflect two glowing red bolts of verity from her blade. A unicorn puppet stood at the other end of the street, red mane flaring out from its black form, seemed content to throw magic missiles at her, as unicorn puppets usually did. Rarity thanked Celestia I didn't have any shards to toss. Simple spells she could handle. She caught the reflexive iron hump coming at her in one of Forpal's facets, and spun parry to block a series of rapid blows. She ducked more powerful swipes so to free Forpal to fight another blast of magic missiles. She had the sense to aim them in the puppet this time, but it caught them with red bursts of moment field. The puppets weren't that easy to kill. Rarity was holding against the puppet and iron hump, rapidly spinning each foe and blocking their attacks, but she wasn't gaining any ground. It was only a moment of time before she slipped up or they got lucky. Then she was die. This was in no way, shape, or form an accountable outcome for her. She jumped as high as she could in the air. It was admittedly was not very high. It pushed Forpal beneath her. 
where she flipped a bit of magic at it. The blade shattered and the shards were sent flying through the air at her opponents. Iron Hoof and the puppet each had the acumen to use their magical senses to detect the deep hit four shards, where an attack provided a must needed distraction. She quickly rushed out to put her back to the wall to face both her opponents. Then, she threw her blade at the puppet once again. To her dismay, the puppet caught every one of the shards on a moment field as Iron Hoof charged at her. She drew the shards back through the air to reform her blade to parry Iron Hoof's thrust. Then look at the puppet too late to see metal shards being towards her, in case of red energy. It did have swords, she thought. It was just waiting for the ideal moment to use them. Why did these brutes get so smart? She couldn't use her blade to deflect the shards without exposing herself to Iron Hoof. The strain and constant contact had left her mentally weary enough, so she couldn't split part of Forple to intercept them. Thankfully, the building behind her chose that moment to collapse. Reddy caught Glint's Iron Hoof being showered with splinters and rubble before she was thrown momentarily to the ground, protected for the classic storm surf by an armored body of another pony. She made a slight whining noise as her face was pressed against the very cobbles. Thank you, Applejack, for saving my life, she said cutly. Please stop touching me. You are so grand, you rares. Applejack just rose up and shook off several pounds of stone, wood, and glass, completely unscathed. She placed herself between Rarity and the unicorn puppet to raise an armored foreleg. As Rarity rose to gather forepole, she saw a shard strike Applejack's leg and bounce away harmlessly, spark flying. Applejack caught another shard in her mouth. Rarity had made Applejack some armor with the assistance of Luna, who was the only pony in Equestria who still knew how earth pony war plates were made. So a thick set of mundane steel barding that had been magically folded in upon itself for structural strength. The entire suit weighed more than Applejack herself, and the extra weight helped her gather momentum as she needed to break through solid stone walls. The armor was a sharp shade of red, and Rarity made as annoying as Applejack letter. The joint and neck were protected by angular plates, and the golden filigree spiral had swirled around the main plates to form intricate apple designs. Top her head, her trademark sets had still stat, battered from being forced through at least one building. Applejack spat blood, metal, and teeth. Then she leaned over and struck Iron Hoof, who was pinned beneath some rebel, but other eyes uninjured. It was immediately knocked unconscious by Applejack's steel clad hoof. The unicorn puppets sent more shards and masculine dip missiles their way, but Ray twisted and spun four to deflect each of them. As he did, AJ spoke. Prisoners are mostly free, but we got about 20 puppets and two unicorns two blocks over. I think we can take them together. Ray threw four at her point, only to have it deflected again. So he sighed, of course you do. So if you use your discretion, or would you rather we simply plow through every obstacle in our way, screaming like a bunch of barbarians? Hmm. Applejack worked her mouth as if the quest required serious consideration. Second one. The skies were cleared. It had taken Luna all several minutes to destroy the puppets that controlled the sky at that particular section of Canterlot. There were perhaps a hundred of them, but they were unarmed, and Luna had to help with Rainbow Das. While Pegasus' puppet might not be strong by herself, her mobility allows them to easily descend upon and overwhelm any forces on the ground. In a matter of minutes, every Pegasus puppet within kilometers could be in the same place. Luna had killed them all. The task had been almost trivial. Aaron Das had been an asset. She was far too fast for puppets to cats, and would use her mastery of Pegasus magic to stare down their foes with fire, lightning, and gale force winds. If an enemy did manage to close with her, she was more than a match physically. Rainbow Das was one of the strongest Pegasi Luna had ever seen, and Luna had been training her in aerial combat. Luna had done most of the work, though. She was a full-powered goddess, an alicorn straight from an age where violence and brutality were commonplace. Her opponents might as well have been made of smoke she reduced them to. She tore them apart with her blade, hose, and they were too far away, blind. Nothing could withstand her. Rainbow Das! The athlete named Pegasus came to hover by her side. What? Das's armor was a full-body suit, a tight-fitting, super-armored cloth that was colored sky blue. Along with Das's and joints ran a multicolored trim designed to emulate Das's polychromatic mane. Rar Luna and Rarity had worked together to create the Sky Pony Varding to afford her maximum protection and flexibility. Luna herself wore a suit under her blade-casting robe, though she had denied Rarity's request to spruce it up. Luna valued appearances, but Rarity's design didn't exactly conform to her standards when it came to intimidation. She looked down at a distant intersection, while with a small amount of concentration, Luna bent the air in front of her into a lens that magnified the crossroads. Rarity and Applejack were close to one another, locked in combat with several dozen puppets and true ponies. Death did not need to be ordered. The air collapsed around the Pegasus with a heavy THRUM! She took in of their direction with her uncanny speed.
Luna followed. Daz landed next to Rarity and Applejack, intent on protecting them. Luna reckoned they'd be all right, so she sped past them and began to destroy their enemies. Her first target was a unicorn puppet, persistent across the square from the trio. As she approached it, she tore several of the cobblestones from the street below her and hurled them at the puppet with magic. It deflected the stones. <clears throat> it threw a wave of force at her, clearly trying to prevent her from closing a distance between them. Luna took the spell head on, and as she was thrown to the ground, she called her unicorn of Pegasus magic to form a sophisticated spell. The round around her dropped several dozen degrees and frost coated the ground, her coat, black blade casting robe. She formed several spears of ice out of the moisture held in the air and flung them at the unicorn puppet. At the same time, she lifted several more cobblestones from the street behind the puppet and drew them toward her. The puppet erected a force field to deflect the incoming force of projectiles, but in no way preventing Luna from closing the distance between them with a powerful flap of her wings. Luna landed beside the unicorn, surrounded in the fog that her winter spell had caused, she cast her blade inside the puppet. The puppet was eaten away from the inside out. It dispersed near the air formed. It was all the colors of night, pure white of moonlight, the twinkling shimmer of starlight, and the soft greens and purples of the aura. The air caused the light to dim, metal to rust, wire to freeze, and flesh to deteriorate. She pulled her blade up from its rainy position, causing the black mist left over from the puppet to swirl around the fog that her drastic tempester was creating. She smiled as another unicorn puppet took notice of her. Trivia! The puppet threw bolts of magical air in the air. She deflected them with her blade, the carrot's telekinetic push of her own, a much stronger push. It was staggered. She closed with it and decapitated the foe with one swipe. Luna beat her wings once more to land amongst the earth points that were attacking her own team. Two swipes and a deer down four foes. Luna joined her trio of points and they proceeded to clear the square. It was not difficult. The arrival of Luna and Rainbow Dash tipped the scales in their favor. The rain puppets went down less than a minute. Two point soldiers, few as they were, were rounded up at Blade Point and brought into a nearby building. Luna, Rarity, and Applejack stat Rainbow Dash followed. The princess did her best to look intimidating. It was a successful effort. She was taller than any pony present, wearing a pitch black blade casting robe, wielding a spell blade. The air around her was filled with billowing fog, and the ground beneath her hooves were frosted over. Her eyes were glowing and her hood was drawn up. The enemy soldiers shivered. The weather from the cold or Louis' presence, the princess couldn't tell. She was being a little dramatic. After all, it was the most ever I died of the Alcorns. An abysmal lot of foes we find ourselves burdened with upon an equally abysmal afternoon. Her voice boomed through the building around them. She saw her allies cringe out of the corner of her eye. They didn't like her royal Catalan voice. One of thought held keep things fresh. Tell us! She dismissed Nadir and leaned forward to took the lead soldier, a unicorn in the eyes. How might one pass the Pyrrhean's barrier? The unicorn's eyes hardened. Even if I didn't know the spell, why would I tell you? Because. The unicorn pulled back. The volume of her voice. We are the only chance thou hast of overthrowing King Titan. You can't be Titan, even if you could. How can any of us be sure you're better rulers than him? You're likely to plunge our world into eternal night as soon as you set the throne. Luna proudly recoiled. Surely that wasn't what people thought of her. The unicorn continued. We've all heard about you, Luna. You've never gotten along with your sister. You probably laughed when you found out she was dead. Now you're just an alicorn trying to peel the power vacuum she created. Luna shook her head. No! She began, her voice losing her volume. I, I don't... If you really were fighting for the sake of Pony Kind, Princess, you wouldn't have disappeared for the past month. You wouldn't have killed Twilight Sparkle. Why don't you just marry Yuperi and sell for being his princess? I'm tired of being forced to fight my fellow ponies because you're trying to take advantage of your sister's death. I'm tired of fighting an alicorn's war. What a look at the unicorn disbelief. He thought she was just as bad as Titan. He thought the fighting was her fault. She felt sick. Suddenly, she was standing amidst hundreds of dead ponies on a scorched and barren plain, looking down at a colt without a cunny mark who had died for her. She felt herself butchering ponies from eons ago, her dying cries fueling her furthest for absolute destruction. She had broken their race then, had taught pony kind to destroy one another rather than love another, and they had. She was vaguely aware of falling to the ground in front of the prince as the temperature in the room dropped even further. Was she doing the same thing now? Was he simply going to lead Pony Kind down the path of destruction once more? If Twilight never woke up, then he didn't stand a chance against Titan and Terra. How long would her war go on then? Years? Decades? Would Twilight's friends die in battle or of old age? 
while they search for the new element of magic? What right does she have to ask them to help her and her sister reclaim the throne? Get out! Her voice has assumed its usual volume. No, she had decided. Twilight Sparkle would come back to them, and they would rescue Celestia wherever she was. Luna wasn't fighting for her parents anymore. She wasn't fighting to kill her sister. She would rescue Celestia and free Pony Kind from Titan and Terra once and for all. A look of surprise crossed the unicorn's face. We're free to go? What? Did Stahl think we were going to gobble the up? Nine commander is ours, and nine prisoners are free. They're of no use to us. Luna didn't know that first bit was true. Hopefully Pinkie Pie had captured her target, and Fluttershy led the prisoners to safety. She stepped to the side and let the unicorn and the other soldiers leave. What at all? The soldiers had left, shivering as they scurried past the frozen princess. After he left, Rainbow Dash said dryly, That could have gone better. I will think maybe next time you all turn down the last princess. Yes, Verdi said, Chief Chowdhury. Would you mind maybe turning the heat back up, your highness? With a thought, she warmed the air around him. Luna had no idea how they could keep their spirits so high after almost 20 minutes of off-and-on combat. She was still thinking of what the unicorn had said. How could she explain it to them? She couldn't tell the general polling populace that Luna was alive, that Celestia was alive, because then their enemies would know that they knew. If that happened, who knew what Titan would do to his Celestia? She couldn't tell him that Twilight Sparkle was secretly still alive either. She would instantly become the most wanted bear in Equestria next to Luna herself. She couldn't tell the population that they had a weapon capable of destroying Titan himself. If her father knew that Twilight and her friends posed a threat, he would most certainly tell Terra to strike them down. Her mother could wipe out Canterlot from the face of Equestria with barely a second thought. So Ponykind had to think Celestia was dead, that Luna wanted to rule them all by herself, that the Loyalist cause was hopeless, that her twice-time hero and savior, personal servant of Princess Celestia, Twilight Sparkle, died a monster. Naturally, Twilight Sparkle had attained virtual messiah status among the Loyalists. While Ponykind wasn't in on the details, Twilight and her friends had effectively saved Equestria twice before. That's probably exactly why Titan had chosen to turn her into his pet monster in the first place. That, and Nile Six Knot could apparently take all of Celestia's magic and give it to his newborn son, Imperion. He had, by his slavier, effectively destroyed the biggest symbol of hope Ponykind had, as well as acquiring a useful asset. In the eyes of Ponykind, Twilight Sparkle had died in the Battle of Cloudsdale with Nihilus Nix Knot, whom Luna had slain. Luna had killed their savior, and it seems he was even more hated now than once he had been when Titan returned. Fortunately, it didn't matter. If Luna had to be a villain to rescue her sister, then so be it. Pony Kind never loved her as much as Inga Celestia, and likely he never would. If Luna was going to save them from her father, she didn't need them to. Fluttershy probably had more than enough time to flee to prisoners of safety, I would think, she said, dropping down to a mild volume, doing her best to curb her arcane accent. Pinkie Pie ought to have come so that I copped by now. This is the way to the underground. With that, they went home. Twilight Sparkle did her best to keep things together. Magic helped. Left alone to her thoughts, she knew she would lose focus and break down again. So Twilight be focused on focusing, keeping herself busy with simple tasks, and spells she decided on her next move. She knew she needed to find her former friends and the princess. But how? She was in the Books of Branches library. Luna could be anywhere. She pulled the Marvel's mantle of magic, mental magics off a shelf with a bit of telekinesis and lit up a diagnostic spell. While true healing magic was impossible, there were all sorts of spells designed to help with traditional medical treatments. The spell was a complex one, so it took Twilight several minutes of study before she could cast it. It indicated she was fine, but that she ought to eat. Twilight didn't feel hungry, and the fruits left out on the table looked as though they had been rotting for weeks. She took note of the state of decay, then searched through the cupboards until she found some oats. To keep herself busy while she forced the oats down with a spoon, she learned a spell to tell her the time. She had calendars and clocks in the library, but no point had been around to mark the calendars, and the clock couldn't tell her the exact date. When the spell told her she had been unconscious for almost a month, the spoonful of oats only faltered slightly before continuing on its course. Twilight munched the oats mechanically, then swallowed and decided she had eaten enough. She pulled the element of kindness out of her null space. The golden necklace wasn't the element of kindness, but rather one facet of a four-part hole. The whole element consisted not just the golden necklace, but also Fluttershy. Its magical power, the idea of kindness itself, 
It was what Confessor like Unicorn Knowledge would have called an impossible enchantment. Twilight created a spell to follow the necklace's link to the ideal that connected both its bearer and the enchantment. She focused on the bearer, holding the portion of the element in her mind. Then, with a small amount of darn energy, she created and cast a spell to find the bearer in reference to herself. The spell gave her a general direction on Carolot. Trying to ignore the popular cases of such a location, Twilight telekinetically grabbed the map of the capital, also held the tracking spell and the enchantment in her mind. She unrolled the map and detected a meta spell in the thermoregical one to pinpoint Flareside's location on the map. It marked her position, and Twilight had the good sense to reorganize the spell so it tracked Flareside and the relative to the position on the map. The spell gave her a direction downward. Flareside was in an undercity. Twilight rolled up the map and deposited it in the null space after marking Flareside's position. Carolot was not far away at all. She managed to make the trip between Carolot and Ponyville by herself three times within 12 hours when she... She needed to focus. So she began to search the library for things she might take with her. She added several foods on the table and began to put up books for her trips. For obvious reasons, Marvelous Manual of Medical Magics might come in handy. She hoped it wouldn't, but never hurt to be prepared. She decided the chronology textbook would be of little use, so it would stay. She moved silently through the library, picking up books and stacking them alongside her travel food on the table. She found only a couple. Mary said her books to exam were useless. Her new copy of the Astronomical Astronomer's Algomic to All Things Astronomy was useless. Slumber 101 was useless. Running and the Running for Dummies was useless. She carefully placed them all on a pile for useless books. She moved through the library, carefully selecting which books to take with her and which books to leave behind. Twilight became slower. Her movements did not become less precise or meticulous, but she began to spend more and more time examining the tiles of the tomes. She levitated new books onto a stack at an ever-decreasing rate, but finally, her glacial pace gave away to absolute stillness. She stood motionless, hardly breathing, staring at the books she held off with magic, then she suddenly sat on the floor and began to cry. Her tears came with great, ragging sobs that broke the otherwise perfect silence of the library. She fell to the ground, rocking herself back and forth, until she could once again focus on what was important. In all, she wasted 15 minutes of time sinking uncontrollably on the library floor. She picked up the book, Draconic Appetites and Ailments, and set it in a useless pile next to the musical storybook. It's a wonderful equestria. Then, she decided she had enough books, and deposited the useless ones in her null space, and left. To draw her attention away from the signs of extensive repairs that the town had undergone, Twilight recalled a cast an illusion spell to disguise her appearance. She intended to first recolor herself white, but changed her mind and went with a pale red. Unrecognizable, she walked towards Canterlot. When she was clear of town, Twilight decided she didn't want to walk. Being alone with her thoughts was counterproductive, so she used a series of teleports to bring her to the city gates. The western gate of Canterlot was still a pile of rubble, and two point guards, as well as puppets, were stationed around it along the walls. What was more, a mysterious current of light rose from within the city itself to the sky. Twilight took note of its appearance, then teleported to the other side of the wall. She appeared in the alleyway and consulted her map. When Twilight Sparkle was nine years old, she became fascinated with mazes. Celestia had left her a book on them on her desk one night, and she got hooked. She spent hours at a time finishing the little maze books that she would buy out of books off of her allowance. After a week, she started doing them in ink instead of graphite. After two weeks, she asked the owners of the bookshop to order her a more complex maze books. They did. Twilight never realized how rarely any point said no to Celestia's most prized pupil. After three weeks, Celestia took a personal interest in Twilight's maze craze, as he offensively dumped it, and asked Twilight if she wanted to see a maze in real life. Twilight answered she already knew the palace heads maverick right by heart. Not only did it feature predominantly in Nightmare Night celebrations, but she could get a bird eye view from the palace. Celestia had smiled and told her the labyrinth she had in mind was much bigger. A day later, she had taken Twilight down to the Candlelight Undercity. It was sprawling a labyrinth that ran underneath all of Canterlot. It was enormous, large enough to hold tens of thousands of points at a time. It was also totally impossible to navigate. In some places, it was made of large square passageways and corners. In others, it was slides and tunnels and curves. Making things worse was the fact that the maze fully took advantage of that existed in three-dimensional spates. It was also pitch dark, on the account it was buried under Canterlot. Twilight hadn't been scared of the dark. Celestia had been with her. 
The princess had explained that the Carolot Undersea was the most difficult event for him that could possibly give Twilight, and that her tennis would be a month. Twilight was forbidden from entering the Undercity, just like every other pony in Carolot, of course. It was simply too dangerous. A pony could get lost and starve to death, or fall into one of the many castles and not be able to get out. So Celestia had given her very four ancient books on the topic to study from. The studying for them, Twilight did. The Undercity occupied almost all of her time for the next month. She read books, analyzed the maps, made models. She came up with a dozen theories as to a purpose in each eventual origin. Eventually, she realized she could split the enormous labyrinth into smaller mazes and solve each on its own. After three weeks, she had the entire labyrinth memorized and could come up with a route between any two points in a matter of seconds. Celestia was thoroughly impressed. Then Twilight learned the true purpose of the exercise. The trainer her mind so it comes to the intense special reasoning she would need to process. She inherited the Sparkle family ability to teleport from her mother. She teleported for the first time two weeks later, to the astonishment of her parents. It wasn't until two years later that Twilight learned, a rare conversation with another student, that there were only four books detailing the Canterlot Undercity, and only two of them contained maps. Celestia had let Twilight in on a very special secret, simply to assure Twilight enjoyed her studies. A month ago, Twilight raped her of her godhood, laughing as Celestia begged for mercy. In the alleyway, Twilight's stony expression flickered slightly as he examined the map once again. There are thirteen entrances to the Undersea that spread the route through Canterlot. One at the palace, six in Air Canterlot, six in Our Canterlot. With the palace at the center of a circle, each entrance portrayed an arc of the length of exactly one sixth pi rate in from its neighbor. She so noted that the nearest entrance ought to be on her map and mentally traced a route that would take her to Flareside's position. Twilight then left the alleyway, still a red unicorn traveled to several blocks to the Undersea entrance. On her way, she passed several heavily damaged buildings, knowing dimly that the ponies were looking out timidly from her to broken windows and doorways. She ignored them, and noticed no puppets on the way to the entrance. The portal to the Undersea had been blocked up and cobbled over, like most of the entryways throughout Canterlot. Ponies were not allowed down there, on account of how dangerous it was, not that any pony could have known where the entrance was in the first place. To Twilight's knowledge, she and Celestia were the only ones who studied the layout of the Undercity. She reached out with her magical senses to follow the hollow area beneath the earth, right where she expected it to be. After a moment of focusing, she teleported. She found herself alone in the darkness, later horn with a bit of illusion magic. The illusion magic immediately reminded her where she had learned to spell to change her appearance, and what she had used it for. Rainbow Dash. Twilight hadn't eaten many oats. She only drank a little bit of water, so she didn't have much in the way of vomit. Still, she stood sinking, resting up nothing, wasting almost a full minute after the others were gone. She made a mental note to eat again soon after setting off throughout the labyrinth. Proper nutrition was important. The various twists and turns of the labyrinth matched what she had in mind. Without Discord to rearrange the maze at will, Twilight could navigate them with ease. Well, this is probably why she had been so eager to dive into the Heads Labyrinth upon hearing his riddle. As he moved through the tomb-like, silent darkness, she wondered why Fluttershy would be in the Undercity. Still, she had, wasn't lost or hurt. Hopefully, she was with the others. Twilight briefly considered taking the other element bearers, but decided to press on. Her journey through the Undercity was, for the most part, serene. She passed through the large rooms and claustrophobia inducing crawl spaces. She teleported across chasms and pushed open heavy metal doors. Twice, she teleported to a nearby section of the maze using her acute spatial sense to determine exactly where she ought to be, skipping two whole sub maces and saving herself a great deal of time. Once, she wandered close to the Air City Labyrinth, and found a certain white magical air seat blocking a passageway. She imagined it was the same barrier she observed from outside the city. She extended her magical senses. They could not penetrate the barrier. Twilight marveled the sheer amount of power it must take to sustain that thing before moving on. It was obvious when Twilight came to Luna's lair. It was set up in what Twilight knew to be a small complex near one of the surface entrances. She supposed he wouldn't have to travel very far to reach the complex, so were less likely to get lost. She stood outside the metal doorway to the chambers, which was bathed in a purple light of her horn and been marked with a crescent moon. Then, she took a deep breath and opened the door. Inside her room was entirely interpreted to from cold stone outside. The walls had been covered with hundreds of cloth hanging done up in warm shades. The floor had been lined with hardwood and one end of the room burned like a magical fire, in front of the plush rug. In the center of the room was a table, a place that was a map of Carolot. A stairway ran up to the overwhelming balcony on four doors, which Twilight soon led to bedrooms. 
Twilight took all of this in with consideration. She was too busy focusing on the room's only occupant. Sitting on the rug, basking in the firelight, sipping a mug of hot cocoa, was Fluttershy. Twilight was in a shadow in the back of Nihilus' mind, looking down at the beaten and bloody Pegasus who had cruelly spun her life in redemption. Was it enough that Fluttershy simply die? No, Nihilus would have Rainbow Task kill her. She would have one friend savagely murder the other. She liked the idea of Rainbow Dash having a few moments of freedom from her nightmare to contemplate killing her most innocent friend. Twilight lost the cold, distant few points she had gotten from her library to Canterlot and was drawn back into herself. She stood in the doorway, wondering how she could possibly face Fluttershy after what she had done. She must have made a noise, because Fluttershy looked up from her place in the fireplace. She saw Twilight, eyes widened, lips parting slightly in amazement. She knew she had to say something. Anything to the Pegasus, before Pegasus and Fluttershy were scared away. I'm sorry. It was so lovely and inadequate. It wasn't me. But it was still her. Her fault. I didn't want anything to happen. But it happened anyway. And Twilight couldn't help that. She cycled through a dozen responses and her mind rested on one. You shouldn't have come rescue me. I didn't deserve it. Twilight! Fluttershy screamed louder than Twilight had ever heard her before. Before Twilight could speak... The Pegasus had crossed the room and locked her in a hug so powerful as to almost suffocate her. You're back. Oh, thanks, Celestia. When Twilight didn't hug back, Fluttershy pulled away to look Twilight in the eyes. Are you alright? You're terrible. Twilight stared back into Fluttershy's eyes, confused. In them, there was no hatred, no rejection. Just pure, simple concern. Concern for Twilight's well-being. Fluttershy was actually worried about her, like an overprotective mother instead of a tormented victim. No, Twilight realized. Not like an overprotective mother, like a friend. Twilight couldn't help it. She broke down and began to cry. For a second time that day, her legs gave way as tears began to stream down her face. I... I... She stammered. Shh. Where should I hide her again, gently rubbing her back? Then, the Pegasus picked her up, though, as though she were nothing more than a filly, flew them over into the front of the fireplace. Twilight was set down on the incredibly thick rug and felt the warmth of the fire spread through her. She didn't realize how cold it had been in the labyrinth. She buried her head in Fluttershy's coat, and a friend walked around her almost completely with wings and forelegs. Nuzzled a sobbing Twilight over wispy mane. Shh, I know Twilight. Let it all out. Suddenly Twilight realized why she tried the element of kindness instead of the others. Some part of her knew what she wanted, what she really needed, was some point to care for her, was sold her to cry on. A little kindness. She was getting tears and mucus all over Flair's eyes, so it's seriously soft coat as she sobbed, but the Pegasus didn't see to mind. She rocked Twilight back and forth as the unicorn gasped for air. I, I, I can't do anything! I know, Twilight, let it all go. I couldn't even close my eyes, I... Twilight's entire body shook as she drew in a starting breath. I had to watch. It's okay, Twilight, you're safe. You should have come for me. Of course we should have, Twilight, I love you. I, I thought... Twilight squeezed Fluttershy as tightly as commands. Fluttershy squeezed back. I thought I was never going to get to talk to any of you ever again. I thought it was over. Fluttershy squeezed her harder than Twilight would have thought possible, then released her. Once again, the Pegasus looked at Twilight in the eyes. Her voice hardened. It isn't over yet, Twilight. Not yet. Twilight nodded numbly, and Fluttershy smiled. I'll go fix us some hot cocoa, and when I come back... I'll get you cleaned up, all right? She nodded again. The flares I turned away. Twilight waited, looking into the fire as it cackled merrily. Despite the streaks of tears running from her eyes, she smelled better than she had in a long time. I love you, the flares I had said. Twilight believed her. The flares I came back with two steaming mugs of cocoa and a box of tissues in her mouth. Twilight happily stepped her drink and did not cringe as flares I downed away her face and neck. Flares I did not seem all discomfort by the fact Twilight had just broken down and cried under her wings for the better part of twenty minutes. For that fact, Twilight was immensely grateful. So there's one more thing that set Fluttershy apart. The others are going to be so happy to see you, Fluttershy said softly. Has it really been a month since Cloudsdale? Mm-hmm. Fluttershy nodded. We've been in Candlelight causing trouble for the king, but normally there's some point in Ballot and Ponyfield to watch you. Today we needed everyone, though, because Luna was going to fight. They, um... I wanted to get rid of all the puppets in the Air City and capture a commanding officer, but there were also prisoners we had to set three. You're still with Luna? How is she? She's, uh, nice. I see. How's everyone else? Well... Fireside began. 
Pinkie Pie present! Pinkie Pie burst through the metal door of the labyrinth, complex on two legs, covered in colorful armor and gadgets. Right behind her was a brown-coated, white maned earth pony Twilight never seen before in her life. Pinkie Pie saw Twilight, and her eyes widened. There was a hissing noise and a jet of white gas. Harpoon and tested her foreleg to launch straight downward, or bounced off the ground and clattered to the white resting position. Twilight! She grinned as she began to set various pieces of colorful equipment to her. When another one fell to the ground, Pinkie Pie sprang across the room, pinning Twilight to the floor with a ta another painfully tight bear hug. Oh my gosh, we missed you so much and now you're back! Twilight leaves under a string of Pinkie Pie's hug. Thanks, Pinkie! Pinkie Pie gasped as she came to a realization. We need to throw a party! Flesh Eye! We need to throw Twilight and Perry! She ran upstairs and through one of the doorways. Moments later, various party paraphernalia were thrown about the doorway and over the balcony to lie in front of the fire. Twilight dodged the falling roll of streamers and turned her attention to the unknown nerf pony. And the mayor had been giving her a wide eyed stare since he aired. A you? She trailed off, then slowly approached the Twilight. The way she looked Twilight over made her feel like a specimen display. Except for the look on the mayor's face, she didn't understand what she was seeing. Burning blood of Celestia, the mayor swore in disbelief. You're really Twilight Spock? Um, yes. Yes, this changes everything! Everything! Twilight was confused. I don't understand. You're a lesson, Twilight. You saved a quest you got twice. A Titan will return and you were taken. Celestia killed. Most ponies thought that resisting was hopeless. But if you're still alive then, there's hope isn't there. We can win! Twilight didn't know how to react. Was there hope? She didn't see why not. They still had the elements of harmony after all. Yes, she said finally. We can win. And Celestia isn't dead. The mayor smiled. It's better than I thought then. If we actually have a chance of returning to the way things were, then all the pony kind would support us. It's just the world was certainly suddenly made sense. Then the mayor did something completely unexpected. She knelt on the carpet before twilight. To the late sparkle, she said, her voice taking on a ceremony's turn. I, Captain Coconut Crunch, renounce my loyalty to King Titan. And my position as captain in the royal army. I hereby swear myself to you as your servant and vassal of Celestia's successor. Twice stood frozen, mouth agape. I'm not her successor, she managed after a time. What could possibly give you our idea? You're her personal student, aren't you? You see the question twice on her orders. Who else would rule in her stead? Her sister? Princess Luna? Luna. Luna is ignored at best, despised at worst. The ponies don't see her as any better than Titan himself. Twilight sighed. She was in way over her head. Look, Coconut, is it? Luna is the rightful ruler of Equestria, and the only reason I'm still alive. She risked her own life to save me, and I know she can come off as a little scary, and I know you think she was Nightmare Moon, but Nightmare Moon and Luna were two completely different entities. I would know. You would know, Coconut echoed. That's what happened to you, isn't it? That's who Nidus really was. Slowly, Twilight nodded. I've been asleep for the past month. And now she's back! Piggy by said in a sing-song voice, and we're jumping from the overhead balcony to the carpet in front of the fireplace. She was holding a cake. Piggy's ear twitched. Suddenly she stopped moving. It turned to the waterway as it opened. Case of the glow of unicorn telekinesis. I do remember to wipe your hooves this time, Applejack. I will not spend the past three weeks decorating this hall simply so you could... As Rarity came to the door, she saw Twilight suddenly stopped. Applejack ran into her, and they both went tumbling to the floor. Twilight was encased again in Pony as her friends smothered her with hugs. They squeezed her and asked her if she was okay. Tears were streaming running down their faces. Applejack had to be careful to not crush Twilight to death as she was in a massive suit of armor. Rainbow Dash hugged back when they smothered her. Twilight tried her best to catch her gaze, but failed. When they finished, Twilight came face to face with Princess Luna. Luna was not as big as Celestia. But Twilight had to look up at her. The princess's eyes betrayed none of her feelings. After what seemed like forever, she spoke. We are pleased to see thee, Twilight Sparkle. Twilight cringed. In the voice, Verity reminded gently. Of course. Luna said in a voice that was still several times louder than it needed to be. Thou art healthy and well, Twilight. Then we ought to begin our next course of action. Telling a pony, Pinky cried. Luna narrowed her eyes at the bouncing pony. No, Pinky. Treating Twilight Sparkle what we already know. In party hats, and every pony still gets cake! Luna grumbled. Several minutes later, with every pony seated in a semicircle around the magically burning fireplace, eating cake and drinking hot cocoa, that Luna told Twilight everything. Twilight already knew most of what Luna had to say. 
and such as the fact that Titan and Terra were her parents. But she knew almost nothing about the pre Discordian history that Luna described. The spine tale satisfied thee, Twilight, Luna asked after she had finished. She had a hard time believing the things Luna had said about Celestia. I suppose, Play said. The name Astor Corsair sounds familiar. She was Celestia's most powerful lieutenant, a unicorn trained from birth to make war. She could defeat Celestia and I on single combat by the end of the war. The Corsair scale is named after her. She's also your distant ancestor. Twilight frowned. The part being related to her was a surprise. But it wasn't what was bothering her. She didn't recognize the name from the Corsair scale. She so made a mental note to think about more later. So why do you all have suits of armor? She asked, selling him the errors to change the suspect. Very interrupted. The unicorn had been eating a slice of her cake so slowly and delicately, it was barely half finished. I'm all the gorgeous, dear! I designed them all, with help of Princess Luna, of course. Although Pinkie Pie made most of hers by herself. Did I tell you I'm a knight? A knight? Knight Commander of the Order of Nocturnus. Game that, as it were. Appletech snored. <laughs> also the only member of the Order of Nocturnus. Rarity sniffed. In any case, it helps us all a little safer when we're out casting trouble. I have to wear this robe because I'm a blade caster. Twilight remembered full well what Rarity was capable of. A draw Twilight met her father. She started in really at the memory of the stallion who had driven a slither through her eye. She reminded herself she needed to keep things together. Twilight decided that she would wait a while longer before Rarity knew to run into, and do so in private at least. What about Fluttershy? How could she use Earth Pony magic? I have not the slightest idea, Luna practically shouted. I was hoping that Dallas could explain it to us. Nor do I know how Rainbow Dallas freed herself from your spell. That was a spell, Fluttershy corrected. Of course, Luna groaned. Hmm. Twilight said, Enchantments that couple a pony instead of an inanimate object are unstable by their very nature. I suppose it's possible if fed enough non-native energy, the bondings in the couple could break. But for that to happen, the enchantment would already need to be extremely weak. It was! Rainbow Dash said quietly. Flareshy used to stare. She sat down uncomfortably as she spoke to Twilight. Well, that makes sense, I suppose. My magic isn't supposed to mix. She probably hoped her enchant is grass. As for Fluttershy using Earth Pony magic, I don't know either. It must have something to do with the elements of harmony. I suppose that since we have them in procession, I should study them. That will not have the time, Twilight Sparkle. We need to frighten you! Twilight closed her eyes for a moment. She had been afraid by Luna would say with something like that. I... She paused, looking at her friends, Luna and Coconut. I'm not going to fight. The look that came over Luna's face was hard. Why not? Nihilus allowed herself a slight smile as he punted Pinkie Pie off a balcony that fell to her death. Twilight felt the pain as Rainbow Dash split her face open with the cover of a book. Days later, Twilight had watched helplessly as Dash force-fed herself Twilight's dairy. I just can't! We shall speak of this later. Well now, that's what the every me you know is of my sister. Titan said, This brings me no pleasure, Celestia. Twilight managed to look away, tried to close her eyes, but she couldn't. Please, Celestia managed weakly. The sliver tore off Celestia's ear, chewed it thoughtfully, trying to decide on a name while her spell did its work. You know, she said casually to Celestia, mouth full of flesh. She thought you were going to come and save her. Still does, judging by the racket she's making now. She continued to chew on the air, blood run down the corner of her mouth. Twilight could taste it. Twilight did her best to keep her cake and cocoa down. Nihilus took her power and gave it to Empyrean. She's a simple pony now. No magic at all. Mortal. Luna nodded. I had thought as much. Her voice is almost an appropriate volume by now. Though a spell to thought to remove a pony's magic is supposed to be impossible. Twilight looked down, so Rainbow Dance was no longer her field of vision. I break the rules, she said. In any case, Titan gave Celestia to Terra. I don't know where she is. Luna nodded stiffly, expressing unreadable. Empyrean will know. Now that we have Twilight, we can move against him. But you said there's a barrier between us and the Iron City. Indeed, a barrier that thou shalt shatter. I can't! That's... Thou's disreorder the Corsair scale, Twilight Sparkle. Thou said thyself that thou would break the rules. I... Twilight paused. An Alcorn's magical barrier would be almost impossible to destroy. The laws of magic stated that no system was perfect, though. I'll try, Twilight offered. But I need as much surface area as possible, as much time as you can get me. Luna rose and strode over to the table. Every pony followed. 
Sydney formed a circle of a map around Carolot. Twilight knows several of what looks like Monopoly figures to all to resemble Twilight, Luna, and her friends. The only pony was missing was Pinky. Twilight was certain was represented by the figure that looked like a top hat. The ideal location would be Bolton Square, Luna mused, but it's us halfway across the city. The Pinky side would spot us before we were halfway there. There'll also be reinforcements coming in through the barrier throughout the day tomorrow, after our access today. And even if we do break the barrier, we will need Grawl too. Almost certainly, the coconut added. We usually come through on Day Street, that's any help. I'm gonna give her an icy look. Thou art a prisoner, Compton. I shall not trust the word thou speakest. She's telling the truth, Twilight said. And how does those know it? Well, where else would they use? Twilight said. They would need one of the major streets for width, just for efficiency. Rowan Street is too close to here, where I assume you've been operating out for a while now, and they wouldn't use it. See looked up at Luna. Go on. Princess Lane is too close to the city walls. The barrier intersects Sorrel Street through the Carolot School of Fine Arts, making it a perfect ambush site from our side. If I recall correctly, the school has a long overhang that will crawl Pegasi into one of their approach, and to possibly give us high ground. The scene could be set on Prince Street, but from the other side, they managed to get a sizable force through the Loyalists from the nearest city and could stand on bridgeways, tear them apart with an easy escape route through the glass victory. Not to mention, the factory itself would provide them with lots of ammunition. Twilight began to highlight points on the map, so that leaves Main Street, Star Swirl Avenue, Alcorn Way, and Bay Street as a potential main pros to send your troops down. It's that you're sending troops through the barrier, where you need to assure that they're appropriately proficient and get to their post in the most efficient play possible. This means that you have to hit the cannery, the logistics office, and come out near whatever you're using for the barracks, What I'll assume is a seal mill due to its size, indefensibility, and proximity to high-class housing that you can put officers to enforce the team command. The only streets that do this are Alicorn and Bay. So how do we eliminate Alicorn? Simple. Morale. Alicorn runs through a heavy residential district. Bay, an industrial one. You want to expose your soldiers to as few serving civilians as you can, for fear of a defect. You certainly don't want to give your civilians a reminder they're living in a military state. So, you send your soldiers along the bay, and if anything, the factory workers are encouraged to slack off less as they pass. Twilight conjured an image of the Undersea Labyrinth, and handed it over to Map of Carolot. She began to highlight different passageways. So, Applejack, Pinkie Pie, Rainbow Dash, and Fluttershy take this route through the Labyrinth. They attack the column of reinforcements that are coming through the barrier here, while they're on their way to the barracks. They then draw them back here, in the opposite direction of Bolton Square. Then they take this entrance into the Undersea. It's buried under the sweet shop at the corner of Alicorn and Crown. You'll have to dig. They take this route to go through the labyrinth. So you highlight it more sexes in their color. If all goes well and the barrier goes down, they can rendezvous with us here. Tw another highlight. If not, getting back to this place shouldn't be too hard. You just follow this route here. More colored highlights. Meanwhile, as were you distracted distraction, Luna, Rarity and I emerge from this entrance and walk one block through Bolton Square. They'll still be Pegasi and some puppets and soldiers who will catch sight of us, I'm sure. But I can at least disguise us until we get to the actual barrier. I do my best to break the barrier, and if I fail, we go back the way we came. They won't be able to track us through the labyrinth, because they don't know the layout. If I succeed, however, we push through to the inner city. We don't use force. The barrier coming down will hopefully create chaos. I take advantage of that chaos and once again disguise us, and use this entrance and this route to get to our rendezvous. After we lay low and look for the inner city loyalists, she so looked up for the first time at the room's other occupants. Make sense? You're all staring at those who grew an extra horn. Twat, Applejack said. Where in the hell did you get a map of the labyrinth? Um, well, Celestia taught me when I was little. Well, not really. I taught myself. She just gave me books I needed. Never thought it'd be useful knowledge to have. I'd well, said Luna quietly. The stall known strategy, tactics, and logistics? I did a book report on it when I was 14. Rarity tilted her head. Princess Luna, how do you learn about warfare? Well, no, Twilight said defensively. I picked out the book myself. You picked the book about warfare when you were 14? I, Twilight thought back, remembering. No, she said. No, I didn't. I mean, I thought I did, but... She frowned. Celestia had just given me my own rooms, complete with enough shelves to hold another library. There were only a couple of dozen books she gave to me, though, and when I could pick one to do my report on. She said she picked something we'd never covered before, and I learned something new. She says he always spoiled me with lessons on things I loved. Magic, science, and history. Now I should pick something that doesn't interest me at this time. 
It was just a suggestion, of course. But when Her Royal Highness Princess Celestia gives you a suggestion, we covered about almost every topic on the bookshelf. I had to use a book that I didn't find interesting, and I didn't know anything about. The only one was the book that fit the criteria. The book Celestia made sure was there. Was, that was where I heard the name before. The book's author was Astor. No Corsair, just Astor. What? His voice caused the mount to slide across the table. My sister helped out to read that book? It didn't make any sense, and I hated it. It was about the hell to kill each other. It argued that it was in our nature to kill each other. It described warfare on a scale like a question I had never seen before. It was incredibly detailed, but the author was crazy. He kept referencing battles that never happened, events that didn't occur. His eyes were wild. They did help at Twilight Sparkle. Almost every written word that existed before the time of Discord was destroyed. Celestia and I decided history would begin with the end of him. But Astor was so special to Celestia, she kept five things that Astor had written. The first was her diary. Then she kept two copies of Astor's first book, The Power to Destroy. It just details every war spell from Astor's time. I remember that book. Twice said softly. Now she read it. The Power to Destroy was the quintessential tome concerning war magic. Did not credit any author. At Twilight assumed it was an anthology. I think that one point could have invested so many ways to weaponize magic made Twilight feel ill. Astor Corsair, her ancestor, had created magic missile. Rainbow Dash shifted uncomfortably once again. Her face was unreadable. Celestia also kept two copies of Astor's other book. A book that could arm pony kind with terrible knowledge. Not that could be used to assemble mass armies and slay each other by the tens of thousands. Not also usable by any point wishing to make war, regardless of the magical power. Not also that had no place in the world we want to create it. I have both copies. Twice, six softly. One in my room with Carolot, the other in the Ponyville Library. He said I brought that one with me. So he pulled out Nell, Nell's face and gently sat on the table. Pinkie Pie grabbed it first. She so ooed dramatically as he picked it up. Why does this book give me chills? Pinky says he opened the cover. Every point but Luna leaned in. Well? What does it say? Pinky Pie cleared her throat and read the fir first page. Astor presents, she said loudly. Ponies, make war.